This event is our opening webinar for the series and the topic is the Australian Edge, Digital Technology in a Post-COVID World. We have some terrific speakers for you and without further delay, I would like to introduce Nicola Watkinson. Nikki is General Manager of the Austrade Americas region and will be moderating today's webinar. Over to you, Nikki. Thanks very much, Emma, and it's fantastic to be with everybody today. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, I belong to an organisation called Austrade, and it's an amazing uh, organisation that does two really important things. One is it helps US companies to expand and grow in Australia. And the second thing we do is to help Australian companies to expand and grow in the US. And we have a very strong focus on the tech sector. So we're really excited about the summit that we have going on this week. And there's gonna be lots of opportunities for you to explore different themes around hotspots in technology and how Australia can play a role in your business or how you can get into the US market to grow your business if you're an Aussie company. So to start the session, we have two amazing speakers who don't really need any introduction. Uh, the first of them is Bill Tai. Uh, Bill is a venture capital investor. He is very well known around uh, the US uh, and has made some very successful investments, which I hope he will share a few secrets on. And in addition to that, he's also the adjunct professor of innovation and economic development at Curtin University in Australia. And the second person we have on our panel today is Chris Ayland. He's uh, the co-founder and the chief revenue officer of Go One, one of Australia's star uh, performers at the moment um, in the scale-up stage. We've got about 20 minutes for, some, for a bit of a Q&A with the panel, and then we're gonna open it up for some Q&A uh, from the audience as well. So I'm just gonna jump straight in. And Bill, uh, my first question is for you. I think, um, Truth be told, what originally took you to Australia and to Perth was actually not the burgeoning ecosystem for entrepreneurship. It was actually um, uh, the, uh, the kite surfing. Um, so I'd love to learn a little bit more about that. And I also heard this story that uh, one of the founders who really wanted to get to you actually took up kite surfing so they could get to meet you and pitch their business. Is that true? Um, all of that is true. Um, so I guess the backdrop is that uh, I had learned how to sail in graduate school and then moved from like little sailboats to windsurfing. And I had a company that I founded in the mid 90s. That was a uh, started as an ISP and it became a data center operator in 10 countries throughout Asia. Um, list on NASDAQ through Goldman Sachs and Maureen Stanley. And I decided that if it went public, that I would uh, windsurf around the world and basically not, you know, like in one continuous thing, but stop in a bunch of places and have fun. And on that list of destinations was Margaret River in Perth, Australia. And it was so far away because it's literally on the other side of the planet from me. I just never had an opportunity to go. And one day, a gentleman well known to the Australian community, Larry Lopez, called me and said that uh, he needed a keynote speaker for a conference that he was putting together with Curtin called Univation. And that if I agreed to come out and do a one hour keynote, that they would cover my flights and I could go windsurf kitesurf for a week. And that's what I did. And so on that trip, um, I met Melanie Perkins, who pitched to me what would ultimately become Canva. That's a fantastic story, and it really shows how determined some, uh, some you know, good founders are to, to get in front of the right people. But look, you've stayed in uh, connected with Perth ever since, um, and you've made a number of investments in Australia. What is it that keeps you investing in Australia? What, what are some of the sort of secret sauce that you found there? Well, you know, I think one thing that most people don't know is that um, very prominent companies like Apple will actually test some of their products in Australia and New Zealand before they launched them in the United States. Because the, uh, the you know, use case is similar, the behavior is similar, the GDP per capita is similar. So they find it a good contained market around which to try things out. And over the course of my trips, which started really kind of around, I think it must have been around 2010, 2011, there was a sea change in the type of 
technology companies that were available to invest in. Uh, prior to the mid-90s, almost everything was hardcore technology selling to other technology companies in semiconductors and network equipment. And as the business moved towards the user interface layer, you could have kids like Mark Zuckerberg at the time start a business in a dorm room. And literally on the trip to Perth, where I was speaking for Larry, I saw some young people in the audience and I thought to myself, you know, Mark Zuckerberg started his thing in a dorm room. There could be somebody going back to the dorm room here to code something up. I should find out who that is. And with that, we started a startup competition that first was called the WAP Awards for Western Australia App Awards that became the awards because it went nationwide and then regional, and then it kind of morphed into something called the Extreme Tech Challenge, which finals are happening this week. And we have 2,700 applications from 87 countries in the world and we're down to 50 finalists. But it, it's become the case we could start companies anywhere. Australia, I think, has a very, very good um, baseline in terms of understanding rule of law. A lot easier for me to work in Australia than it is in, you know, say, Southeast Asia or really almost any other place because the uh, familiarity with kind of, you know, the way to get things done is, is there. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's true, and uh, I know I've worked in many places around the world. I'm sure uh, you have, and and many of the audience. And I think that ability for U.S. and Australian uh, people to be able to talk uh, quite directly and manage the distance um, really effectively uh, is is a great secret to success um, between Australia and the U.S. And and on that note, Chris, I I might bring you into the conversation because um, you you are definitely a great example of an Australian company that has successfully made its way um, over in, into the US. Uh, you and your co-founders started Go One in 2015 and you've recently just closed a round of over 60 million with some fairly impressive investors behind that including Amazon's Madrona and Microsoft 12 and Salesforce Venture and Seek. Um, how was your company so well positioned to fill the market gap that you identified and what's been your experience uh, working over in the US? Yeah, thanks Nicola. And um, we're lucky and excited to be here. I don't think Bill will even remember this, but in 2013, Bill gave a speech in Adelaide and I was in the audience before. And this was prior to Go One and he was talking about Canva and the journey of being a persistent entrepreneur to get attention and um, sparked something of a, a drive. And so uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, you probably don't remember that speech, but I certainly do. I do. It was uh, in the A and Z building, right? It was, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's it. And so it's sort of serendipitous that it's all looping around at the same time. Unfortunately, I don't have as cool a story as kite surfing. Never was sort of cool enough at school to do that. Uh, as far as go one, you know, my background is a lawyer. And our other founders are a doctor, an economist, and a computer scientist, which sort of sounds like a really bad joke, but it's sort of how we all came together. And I think there's a couple of elements to it in terms of positioning. I mean, obviously, we all went to high school together, so knew each other really well, sort of ride the ups and downs of, of building a company together. Very complementary skill sets, but would also link into what Bill said in that we're an ed tech company and sort of play in the professional education space. And the APAC market is perfect for that. It's a, you know, an area where the government invests a reasonable amount in sort of professional education, where there's early adopters and companies that are willing to sort of give it a go. And really that's how we got started was actually there was a human person, which in, you rarely hear positive things about human people but a procurement person in the Queensland government who decided to give us our first sort of six-figure contract. And that sort of catalyzed our enterprise sales channel from there and it sort of started along. So it's a combination of, I think, having access to really great people who are really humble and just want to get the job done, hardworking or work ethic, a great environment of the sort of economy and the, so the ecosystem that's growing, and then also sort of have a go Australians backing Aussies mentality that I think just means it's a good good place to start to try something new. 
Yeah, thank you for that. And I might pick up on one of those points because I think some things that people don't know so much about Australia is just how multicultural and diverse Australia actually is. About 40% of our population was either born overseas or has at least one parent who was born overseas. Uh, and that means we have an incredible kind of um, diversity and, and very strongly positioned uh, with those networks into the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and I know that that's something that, that you certainly played uh, around with and you've also got operations, I believe, in Vietnam. So how does it work for you in Australia as a sort of a regional head office that looks after the Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say that it was all preordained and perfectly planned in, in the process. Um, one of our co-founders is, is, is Vietnamese, and so one of our earlier moves was to incorporate a company in, in Vietnam and to, to build out a team there, um, to, you know, primarily to do some competitive uh, competition access to talent so that we could get some really talented people um, er, very early on. But, you know, going... So two years ago, when we're you know about two and a half years old, about thirty percent of our revenue, forty percent of our revenue was international, and it wasn't international from the U.S. or the U.K. at that point. It was international from Malaysia, from Singapore. Uh, we had a sort of significant amount of revenue coming in from Singapore and Malaysia in particular, but also Vietnam and sort of Hong Kong, and that was a really um, I think unique testing ground for our offering so that when we did choose to move to the US about a year, a half, a year and a half ago, we'd already proven out our product, our sort of go-to market strategies, and ultimately demonstrated that we can scale in different regions, um, which was just a really strong foundation to jump into the US market. Yeah, thank you, because I think it's not a lot in its but we're keeping off other neighbouring markets which may be less familiar uh, to, to some of the US uh, businesses that are looking at expansion opportunities. So Bill, I might pass to you and ask you, you know, from a US perspective, what kind of advice would you give to uh, companies that might be considering expanding and growing their business in Australia? You know, it's a, I think it's a great place for, for, uh, for me personally, obviously, it's really easy for me to transition. You know, the, the travel is one thing, but, you know, once I land, actually, you know, I have to say it's easier for me to adjust flying to Australia than it is to Europe. And why is that? It's a really, really long flight, so it forces me to sleep almost eight to ten hours, depending on, you know, how many flights I take where if I go the other way, it's like I can only sleep five or six hours and I feel terrible the next day. And so, you know, if you can force yourself to do that and when you hit the ground, it's just a very comfortable environment because it physically is a lot like the United States. I mean, it's, you know, spacious and the weather's, you know, kind of similar and the culture, I think, is, is relatively speaking, it's similar. You know, so I'd say in terms of uh, uh, understanding, you know, people run into problems expanding their businesses to other markets when they don't have a common baseline for understanding the people that are driving their offices. And I think uh, Australia, it's quite, it's a lot easier to, to have a common understanding. I might just ask um, Chris in the meantime, you know, we've seen obviously COVID has, has occupied our minds um, a lot over the last few months. Um, how do you think the tech sector has responded? And are there any standout leaders that, that you have really been following during this period? Yeah, it's been a, a roller coaster. And I think you know, anyone that has been running a startup or building a startup or running a large technology company through this process, um, don't know if we'll we want to sort of repeat the experiences of the roller coaster of the past past three or four months. But I'm also really encouraged and proud of of how multiple organisations have responded. I mean, from a go one perspective, we're really lucky that we can we're in an industry in, sort of in professional education, which means we can help support people through the transition. And so we released a number of free training programs in conjunction with the Singaporean government and the Australian government and the Seattle government that helped people in the transition to remote work and provided special education opportunities when they might be furloughed in the UK or something like that. But I think for me, 
there's like three categories of organization that I've been really most proud of. One's a really local one. Um, so, you know, you see local entrepreneurs, um, my favorite gin distillery in Queensland pivoted and started producing hand sanitizer instead, which is just an amazing example of just pivoting at the last minute to not only obviously have continued the business, but to, to sort of push, help push forward and support the sort of social change that was required. And then the second one, you have sort of mass communication. And I know Bill's an investor in Zoom, um, where a um, strong user of Zoom is a tool. And, you know, that tool has just enabled that whole ecosystem, really. You know, usage has gone 20, 30, 40 times. And for that organization to scale that quickly, I think um, Eric and the team there have done an amazing job. And then probably the third one is um, organizations like Headspace. You know, everyone has experienced, I think, some form of anxiety or adjustment challenges in the, in the last period. And organizations like Headspace and in the mental health area, I think have done a great job of um, releasing products for free and um, supporting people through this transition. Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, seeing some of that extra behavior of companies and how they've managed to either pivot to new markets or, or reposition themselves in new segments or just adapt to product uh, from gin to hand sanitizer. You know, those are great examples of, I think, you know, the real entrepreneurial spirit that exists in Australia um, and around the world. Uh, but I think it's it's something where Australians are very much known for their ability to quickly adapt to new circumstances and never let the in way of, of being successful, uh, you know. So it's, uh, it's one of those particular characteristics. So, um, so Neil, I don't think we've got you on visual, but I, I hope we've still got you on the line. Um, one of the questions I know people will be um, wanting to ask you is, what are some of your technology picks um, and for the coming, you know, six, 12 months? And, you know, are there, is there anything that's exciting you about any of the Australian technology that you've been seeing coming through? You know, so I guess, I mean, let me give kind of a bigger picture framework for my background, because everyone has a unique background, whatever that is, and mine was a kind of a singular path that uh, is becoming more relevant to a broader community. But I started off as a chip designer, semiconductor computer chip designer. So I, I kind of look at uh, things at, from the inside out and how they work and, and really kind of started funding things that moved electrons around first and in silicon and then started funding equipment that was built out of silicon that moved electrons around in a broader scale and then started funding networks, internet things that moved them through phone lines until they started to hit computer screens. And then I started to fund apps that sat on top, which is when my, my background intersected with Australia. And it was literally on that trip that I described where I had just come off a period where I was funding a bunch of one-person companies, designing things on the front of the web, like TweetDeck or Tango Video or other apps on phones. And that's when I started to run into people like, you know, Melanie Perkins and others that could start these web-based companies. So it was kind of chips, boxes, networks, user interface. And then in that wave of user interface, I was working with companies that were doing a little bit better job than others, getting customers and keeping them by using data science and really just understanding the user engagement and how people interacted with their products. And it became clear to me that that was a very big wave. And so that's where I kind of focused today. And you see it everywhere when you think about the implications for anything from retail. And I'll use the example of companies like Walmart compared to the older generations of Sears and JCPenney's and Woolworths and all that stuff, they basically are able to track all of their products inside their own data cloud because they know where everything is all the time. And they can see when it leaves the system on a point of sale terminal and move stuff around so they have a less, uh, less cash need than their competitors and have done better. So Amazon, Walmart, they're kind of data science clouds with products on them. Uber is a data science cloud with cars on the end of it. Airbnb is a data science cloud with rooms on the end of it. And I think we're moving into this period now where everything is virtualized, where goods, value, and people are represented digitally connected to a cloud. That's where we are right now. 
you know, if you think about what Zoom is, and we should be using Zoom, not WebEx, we wouldn't have this video issue. You, we basically have virtualized ourselves where we can connect to where we need to be through the internet, not have to get on a plane. You know, so it's just a far more efficient way to do everything. And so I think the things that are, are marginal productivity through software and through uh, kind of the ap applied data science is where things will be. And there's, there's a fair amount of activity in that space. All kinds of applications. There's another company I funded, Safety Culture, which sort of has done that with uh, accident reporting, you know, kind of occupational health and safety. In America, they call it OSHA, uh, Oc Occupational Health and Safety Administration Compliance. They basically take all of those activities and turn them into little digital things that then are stuck on a cloud, and they can track them and use data science to make the reporting and feedback loop a little bit more efficient. You know, so I, there are literally thousands of things possible with digitization. So I think it's quite a big wave and plenty of it possible. I mean, and there's great companies like whether it's Atlassian or Freelancer or, or uh, 99 Design. There's so many companies in Australia that do things like that. Okay, so these are data science cloud-based businesses that uh, that are going to find uh, a lot of uh, you know growth and opportunity in the coming period. Um, Chris, is there anything you'd like to add as well? Um, any of the education has uh, also gone through a fairly uh, disruptive period, but also discovered that how much it can do online. Are there other areas that, that you think are going to be prospective over the next 12 months or so, where, where we're seeing going to see a big uptick? Yeah, I think um, I mean, we've certainly seen it from the perspective of, of education and corporate education, but I think it's clear that everyone's professional lives have changed as a result of COVID-19. It's sort of forced the hand of organizations that perhaps never thought they would go digital to go digital and just change how we interact with each other, like, like, like Bill was saying. And so I think there's going to be a whole suite of um, professional productivity companies that sort of emerge from the COVID period or are accelerated through the COVID period which will also continue to change our, our, our work life. And from an education perspective, we're seeing this, we're already seeing some, some new ed tech companies spring up. We're seeing increasing investment from companies into the professional education of their team. Um, and that's sort of taking place across the different productivity tools, whether it's sort of the HR tools, whether it's the communication tools, whether it's the development tools, that sort of whole work life 2.0, that's going to be, I think, a significant um, significant point in momentum over the next 12, 24 months. Okay, brilliant. And I'm now going to move to a few questions from the audience. So, um, Chris, I'm going to start with one for you. Uh, and the question is, what do you wish you knew before you entered the US market? It's a good question. It's actually a tough question. Um, so, I think there's a couple of really obvious answers, or they sound obvious, but actually they're really hard to get right. And <laughs> So I think one is to acknowledge the cultural difference between Australia and the US. And there are lots of things about Australia and the US that are very synonymous and very compatible, but there is a cultural difference, particularly in the sales process. And that is a challenge, I think, for any team in hiring in the US and trying to bring the two teams closer together. Even to little topics around Australians are generally a little bit less direct in how they express themselves than than sort of US team members. And that is a management step that you might not think you need to sort of discuss but and work through, but it, it, it definitely is. Um, and the second is the first hire on the ground in the US is um, fundamentally important. And you should take time, seek counsel from investors to make sure that first hire is right. Because that will sort of set the direction of the future. And Generally, when some organization enters the U.S., they move upstream because of the company profile. So sort of 60,000 companies in Australia, and there's more than 60,000 companies in California alone. And so an organization generally starts selling upstream into larger companies. And so you sort of need to acknowledge that and start building that into your sales motions. Otherwise, it will sort of struggle if you're trying to follow exactly the same sales processes and methodologies you are in Australia. That's brilliant. Thank you. 
And Bill, um, I've got uh, many questions for you, but we've only got uh, about uh, three minutes. So I'm going to uh, just uh, pose two to you uh, quickly. Uh, one is around uh, software startups, and I guess there's that famous saying that there's always an app for that. And the question is, is it more prohibitive to start a hardware or an integrated company than a software company? Um, and then the second question I'm going to pose for you to, to pick up, which is, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Okay, so on that first topic, I'd say that um, uh, yes, you know, software is an amazing thing now. It, it's really evolved over time where uh, one thing to note is that software development is no longer development, it's permissioned plagiarism. And, and there's a great ability to repurpose work now where as a, as a software designer, you can go to all these open source repositories, whether it's GitHub or GitLab or a hundred other small ones and take chunks of code and rebuild things. So there's acceleration now that was not possible before in terms of bringing things to market rapidly and testing and iterating. So I'd say the, the ability to be cost effective with your capital and software is just getting better and better and better. And if you integrate hardware, there are some wonderful opportunities there that are highly defensible if you can do them as Apple has proven with the iPhone. That said, the amount of capital you need to get to market is bigger and the amount of time it takes to develop a product, test it, get it to market is longer and the risk profile for where things can go wrong, you know, you buy a batch of subcomponents some don't work, oops, you know, then you might have blown a lot of money. The, the risk reward is just a different picture. So from an angel investor perspective, it's easier for me to deal with software only. I well consider hardware-based businesses, but uh, I look at those with a different plan because I know that they, they will require more capital over time and take a little while, while to get there. Um, the, uh, let's see, and the second question was, uh, I, I forgot the second question while I was the answering best, first. The best piece of advice you've ever oh, been given. Advice. Yeah, I, you know, it's really about uh, about being efficient with your time. You know, because I'd, I'd say, and, and I'm trying to remember, I, you know, the best advice I've gotten from uh, in, about investing has always historically come from a guy named Don Valentine, who started Sequoia Capital and was on the board of the first startup I joined. And I would say, you know, he he to me was one of the most efficient thinkers. He just was, didn't waste time. And I'd say, I'd say it's really, really important to set your priorities and stick with them and to narrow the focus at any moment of time to the couple of things that matter. You know, because a lot of people can spin their wheels solving and resolving or trying to solve or solving different iterations of the same problem over and over. And in startup life, you know, I'll just make it up, but if you have a burn rate of four or 500 K a month, two months is a million dollars, right? So, so the quicker you solve the issues and iterate to a hopeful success, and if you're wrong, you iterate again, the more time you have. I had a great, great, great CEO. I once hired the CEO of Micron, the founding CEO of Micron Technology, to a company that was in trouble. And it was amazing because we used to call him the Ever Ready Bunny on steroids. And, you know, you see that TV commercial where the Ever Ready Bunny is just kind of walking and walking and walking, and then he bumps into a wall and goes sideways, and he goes back and forth until he finds a crack. He was a guy that was able to live 10 lives in the same time period as any other CEO would live one life. So they literally had 10 times the chance of success because he could try 10 times when other people could try once. And so I think people that are quick to address the issues in front of them, recognize problems and go and try to solve, whether or not they hit the right solution right away, doesn't matter as long as they're quick at it and do it with the result, they, they have better outcomes. So I'd say just be super efficient with your time, focus on the right things. That's great. And, and that's a great note to, to be writing up on because we are now at time. Um, I hope that uh, you have enjoyed this uh, quick session. Uh, we've managed to run through some great examples of technologies um, that are out there at the moment. We've had a bit of a future forecast at some of the technologies that are going to come through. 
We've talked about Australia and the US and how these markets can be prospective uh, and how they can help to support business growth and also the links for Australia into the Asia Pacific region as well. So um, uh, nothing more for me to do except to thank Chris and to thank Bill very much for joining us for the start of this technology summit. And we look forward to having uh, many of you um, on the audience join us for other sessions uh, over the course of the week. But Bill and Chris, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken to join us. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Bill. Bye-bye. Bye, Emma. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Chris. Take care, everyone.